Um, so today, the theme of the lecture is play like a pro, right? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Um, but I thought I would prepare kind of a funny theme of pros losing really quickly. And I had some threshold where all the games we're going to see are games 15 moves or less where a strong player loses. Um, and we're going to start with a game which Nakamura lost in, wait, let me check the move number. He lost in 12 moves. Um, and actually, I was watching this game live, and I was just uh, being wildly entertained because um, he, uh, he got pretty crushed. Um, and it was played in the US Chess League, which, it, which is now actually the Pro Chess League, um, but it was played online. Um, this was played back in 2009. Um, it was game, I believe it was game 90 minutes. Um, now it's, it's much, uh, much more fast paced. Um, but to lose in 12 moves in a 90 minute game, uh, as you'll see, something went terribly wrong. So he was playing against relatively strong GM, uh, Julio Becerra uh, from Florida. And they went into a Sicilian. And sometimes Nakamura will do this online. We'll, he'll, he'll play very uh, offbeat, sometimes completely absurd, or in this case, just uh, dubious openings. And here he played a move which maybe some of you just haven't seen before. He played knight f6. Has anyone seen this move before? You have? Maybe a few people? Um, knight f6 is not a popular move against, uh, against e4 and, and knight f3 simply because white can play e5. And it's sort of combining the Sicilian with the Alakine, but as we'll see, white gets uh, some very nice lead in development. So knight d5 is played, and now knight c3, um, simply wanting to trade off black's only developed piece and, um, and open up the center further. So black plays e6, knight take d5, e take d5, and now I like the move that Julio Becerra played, uh, d4. Simply trying to open up the center when all of black's pieces are still in the back row. White already has a nice face advantage, and the bishops are ready to develop uh, very freely. So Nakamura plays knight c6. And now, um, now white actually just wins a pawn here. I don't know if you guys realize, but uh, it was a simple, simple move to play, yeah? Yeah, d takes c5 with the idea that this pawn is, uh, is very weak on d5. Um, now, the last lecture was about how double pawns, maybe not necessarily a bad thing, but in this position, it's not so good for black. Um, so after bishop takes e5, white goes up a pawn and keeps the initiative, um, attacking the bishop on c5. Naka plays d6. And now Becerra plays uh, bishop to c4. And this was actually a weird moment. I was trying to analyze um, a bit earlier, because it looks like Nakamura has a very natural move here, which he didn't play. Uh, what would you guys play? Yeah, Ken? Castle. Oh, you would castle here. That's a possible move. Yeah? Bishop yeah, bishop e6 is probably the most, uh, the most natural move screaming to be played. I mean, defend the maid, attack the queen, um, get some initiative. Naka played neither castling nor bishop e6. Um, I think he played uh, perhaps a worse move. He played queen e7. Right, wrong, so if bishop e6 were played, um, I think queen d3 would be played. And black should actually be doing OK here. Black's still down a pawn, but at least there's some initiative. Knight b4 would be an option, and it could get a bit, uh, it actually could get a bit messy. But I think this is a much better option for, for black. Um, after queen e7, this is where we'll start to see problems. And I think when, when Naka played queen e7, he did not perhaps acknowledge white's next move. It was a very simple move, bishop to g5. Just developing with tempo. Um, f6 was played. And now white to move. And I was very impressed with, uh, with white's next move here, because it's, uh, it's just simple but very strong. Yeah? Long castle, very nice. We don't care about the bishop. We care about accessing the open files in the center. When white castles queenside, 
you already get one rook to d1, and you're preparing to move the other rook to e1. You are leaving the bishop hanging, but um, I mean, the, the attack is more, more valuable than material. And if black were able to, or were to take on g5, uh, this would end very badly. White could just take on d6. And uh, the queen is attacked. The e file is now open, so rook e1 is a threat. The bishop is hanging. This would be very, very bad. Uh, so Naka did not take on g5. He took on e5. And now white played one more move, and black just resigned. Anyone want to guess at uh, the last move here? Yep. Rook h e1. Do you, do you want to say the same thing? Okay. I believe it was rook h e1. Very nice. Um, rook h e1, uh, it's incredible because material is equal. And Nakamura just resigns because there's so many threats and black is just completely stuck. White's pieces are fully optimized. The bishop still can't really be taken. Um, if the bishop is taken, then just knight take e5 and uh, black's whole position just falling apart. The king is stuck in the center because of the, this open diagonal. It can't, uh, it can't escape the center. And meanwhile, let's say black plays a move like bishop to b6. White is ready just to take on e5 and just explode the whole center. Um, one possible line is knight take e5, but then after rook take e5, uh, there's all these mating ideas. Queen take e5 would lead to queen, take, queen to f7 with mate. So that's how you beat Nakamura in 12 moves. I don't think he was having the best day. Sometimes you have to be at the right place at the right time against the right player to have a game like this, especially to have a game like this against a super GM. But um, well, it goes to show no one's invincible. And this was part of a, a weekly league. So uh, it, was part, it was a team match. And I'm sure his team was not happy with him because he's like one of the top players in the league. And um, to lose in 12 moves is not the most encouraging thing for a, for a team. <laughs> So how about we move on? I think we'll get to a lot of games this lecture, because all the games are very short like this. So let's go on. Um, I think I'd like to show a game that I played. Uh, this was about a year ago. I was playing against a WGM um, in Spain. Uh, name is Jana Bellin. And um, she's actually, she holds a position at FIDE. I think she's a FIDE medical officer. Um, and she's played, I think, many Olympiads for England, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but this game, I got the better of her. She played a, an opening, um, or she played into an opening I think she wasn't too familiar with. Uh, this was last year, not this year. So last year I did a bit worse than this year. Um, but this game, um, this is actually one of my quickest wins ever in recent tournament play. Uh, it was nine moves. And it was thanks to some nice opening preparation. I actually didn't prepare too deeply this game. I just prepared an opening that I had a feeling she wouldn't be so comfortable with. And I'll try and explain kind of the process I used. Um, I knew she played the, the Nimzo Indian or Queen's Indian, which you guys should know is a d4 opening, uh, or a d4 uh, response to d4, where black usually plays something like um, e6 and b6. Um, I looked her up in the database. I saw she had hundreds of games from all over the years, and she, she played this consistently. So against players like this who play like this, this setup exclusively, I usually like to trick them a little bit by playing c4 first move. And the difference is, after black tries to accomplish this setup with e6 or b6, uh, the plan for white is to play e4, which wouldn't be possible in these d4 main lines, because I start very early with c4 and knight c3. And essentially what happened, uh, she played b6, I played e4. This was the end of my preparation. Um, I was already happy here to get this pawn advance. And then she started thinking. Um, and the issue for black is that I want to play, uh, play e5 and just kick away the knight. And it's perhaps not so clear how black should respond to the threat. Um, so she played a move here which is inferior to the best move. So you're saying d6 is one option for black. Um, 
I will say d6 is not the best move. What did you say? e5, e5 is the best move. Um, and this is what she should have played. Uh, what she did play is d6. Oh. <laughs> and the problem with d6, it's just it's slow. It, it's a bit passive to play, especially to play d6 and, e and b6 so early. It's usually not the best thing to do within the first three moves of a chess game. Um, so I just play the most principled move. I didn't really calculate too much here. I just played d4 as it's screaming to be played. And um, now she, uh, she played what I think is just a losing move of the game, her next move. Bishop b7, maybe she should play. Uh, she played pawn c5. And when I had played d4, I had, a, I had some idea of, of this happening. Um, and then when she played c5, I was so happy that uh, there's some, some tactics about to happen in white's favor. So white to move in this position. Um, I'll give some people a chance to think and find uh, I think there's a, a forcing way to win material here. OK, Arjun. Uh, e5 with the threat of queen f3. You wanted to say that too? Uh, very strong move. And this is a problem with her setup. This, uh, <laughs> actually, this exact pawn formation runs into queen f3, where in many cases, the rook is just trapped on, on a8. There is like no resource for black to defend the rook. So when I play e5, I have the double threat of queen f3 and also simply to take the knight. So now black's in trouble. Um, and here she thought for a bit, and she takes on d4. Um, now wait to move. How to continue? OK, so you want to trade the knights and then play queen f3. You have the right idea, but the wrong execution. Um, if you play queen f3 first, it could get a bit messy if black takes on c3. And maybe it's playable. Um, the simplest approach is to trade knights first. Oops, not play f4. Trade knights. And now this position is really important, because queen f3 looks great. But there's a problem with queen f3. Queen f3 runs into d5, and the rook is saved. So queen d5. Um, so I had to kind of pivot ideas. Um, if I can't trap the rook with queen f3, I can trap it with queen d5. Oh, take on g7 first. That would be a, a big mistake. Because <laughs> I allow her, her bishop to uh, threaten some nasty things to fork on b2. So that's only helping black. But queen d5 immediately. I'm now winning material. So black has one last hope. It's already move seven. I'm <laughs> winning, uh, winning a lot of material. Black's hope is to trap the queen. If you're watching the lecture, uh, or if you were here for the lecture the other day, we had a game online where we, we won the rook on eight and then got the, the queen trapped, and it was very painful. Um, when I went into this variation, I had essentially calculated ahead and saw my queen will be able to escape. So she, um, she played a, an interesting attempt, queen c7, queen take eight, and then knight c6. And uh, my next move was necessary to see ahead of time. And after I played my next move, uh, she just resigned. So white to move. B4. B4. Interesting. Um, I should mention, or I should have mentioned, that black wants to play king d7 and bishop b7. So let's see your idea. What if I play king d7? You would take? And then take. It could get a bit messy, because now black is threatening this and this. b5 first, after king d7. This could potentially work. And then the queen could retreat. Though, can I be really clever and play this? Oh, you would take, and then if king take, queen e8. Oh, bishop take. Yeah, the queen is trapped. But white has no time to take on a7. Because uh, the queen is now defending. Um, so yeah, there is a threat of king d7 and, and uh, bishop b7. So 
I do want to, to open up the queen side somehow. Yeah? C5. Yeah, C5. I can afford to give away a pawn when I'm up a rook. And when I play C5, I have the very direct threat of bishop A6. And if, uh, if king D7 is played, she actually just resigned after C5. But if king D7 is played, I'd be happy to do this, where I'm pinning the knight. And um, I want to take on c6, and if bishop to b7, I can take on a7. Because the knight is pinned, and my queen will escape. And I'll just be up a rook. Um, so this was a pretty satisfying victory. Um, the game ended in probably about half hour, and I had lots of time to rest and, uh, and prepare for the next game. So it goes to show why tactics are really important in the opening, especially in a line that you're not familiar with. I think she just let her guard down from very early on. Um, I played something a bit offbeat, and then before she played c5, she had to be very cautious about uh, the potential tactics. Uh, let's see how many more games we can get through. Um, let's take a look at the Karpov game. We're going to see Karpov lose in 12 moves. This is a fun one. Have you guys heard of Larry Christensen? <coughs> Any of the, have you, you guys have heard of him too? Maybe? Yeah. He's known to be a very attacking player. He played US championships many years ago before the field got ridiculously strong. And um, he's famously, no famously known for beating Karpov in 12 moves. Question? Oh. No? OK, so um, the opening was actually a bit shocking for this sort of length of game because it was a very kind of quiet opening. Um, it, started as a Queen's Indian. And then this is one of like Karpov's bread and butter openings, like very positional, very solid for black. And then eventually went into a hedgehog after bishop e7, knight c3, c5. Um, this is a common idea, which I should point out, where black played bishop a6 first to deflect the queen to c2. So now it's not supporting the d-pawn. So when c5 is played, white can't play d5. If the queen were still on d1, d5 would be a very strong move to gain space. But with the queen on c2, these pawns are being traded by force. So the position is very fine for black after take, take, <coughs> knight c6, more trades, and then bishop f4. And I think this is a round where Karpov went a little bit nuts and play the move which I don't think can be a good move, at least in hindsight can't be a good move. Uh, but before we see that, what would you guys play in this position? Um, bishop, e7. bishop e7 is very possible. Maybe it could walk into e5. Arjun? Mm, d5 is interesting. d5 could walk into rook d1, though. Knight h5 is what Karpov played. Um, which I actually, it's probably an okay move to try and deflect the bishop from f4. But uh, the continuation was, was very, very bad. Um, if Karpov doesn't want to play knight h5, I think another option is just to play d6. And then ideas of, uh, of queen c7, bishop e7, e5 would be under control and black and castle. And just get a normal hedgehog position. But now we'll see. <coughs> knight h5. Bishop retreats. Of course, white doesn't want to trade knight for bishop, or bishop for knight. You'll see. Um, and this might be an interesting question. Karpov, in this position, played a losing move. He played one more move. White played one more move. Karpov resigned. So I think in chess, it's very important to be tactically alert, not only for yourself, but for your opponent. And to be on constant lookout, like before you play a move, try and visualize it, and then try and ask yourself, what sort of tactics does the opponent have? In this case, Karpov, I guess, forgot to do that. Um, so does anyone want to try and find the losing move for black? And only say the losing move. Don't say the winning move. Yeah. Bishop D, uh, Bishop D6. Good job, you found the losing move. <laughs> Bishop D6 was played. 
Looks like an interesting move. Uh, positional idea of, of attacking f4. We know Karpov is very strong in positional chess. This game, his tactics suffered a bit. Uh, white to move here. If you see it, don't say anything. White to move and win. For those of you who don't see it, um, it's very important in any position that you identify the undefended pieces. In this case, black has two glaringly undefended pieces that are relatively exposed. The knight on h5 and the bishop on d6. And the key in this position is double attack. So, OK, it looks like everyone, most everyone, is raising their hand. Yeah, all the way in back. Um, QD1. QD1. Queen to d1. Yes, double attack. Karpov misses. this. If you could somehow get this position against Karpov, uh, maybe you could beat him. And um, when a grandmaster loses a minor piece, it's usually just resignable. Um, and he didn't want to fight on from, from this position. So this is a classic one. And this is something where if you miss a tactic in your own games, seeing something like this will hopefully make you feel better about yourself. As if a, a former uh, world champion can walk into something like this, everyone can. So any questions about this? This was a, a relatively simple one. Let's look at another one along a similar theme. Has it ever happened to me? I've lost games quickly. I don't know about that quickly, at least in tournament play. Maybe online play I've lost very quickly. My opponents? Um, well, I just showed you one game, though. <laughs> um, there's been some quick games, but usually a bit longer than 15 moves. Nine moves. But actually, <clears throat> actually, my very first tournament, I lost in, in four moves. It was devastating. A four move checkmate. Um, that was back when I, I didn't know much about chess. So. But then after it happened, it never happened again. So that's how I learned. I was eight. But I was so devastated because I didn't realize it was possible to lose that, that quickly. I was just it was depressing. Um, OK, next game. Uh, Thomas Reich against Milos Pavlovich. Anyone heard of either of these players? You heard of Pavlovich? Yeah. OK. I've heard of him, too. I don't know exactly who he is. I think he's from Serbia. He's a grandmaster. Uh, this game, he lost uh, very quickly against someone lower rated than him. And it was essentially an opening trap. So we're going to zoom through the opening, c3 Sicilian. Um, and this opening can come, um, come up in a lot of like amateur play. I think it's a very simple opening for white to play, where white just grabs the center very early. And this is a common response from black to, uh, to have the queen on d5 and to try and apply pressure on the pawn on d4. So in this game, both players develop. Nothing too unusual yet. Um, but bishop e3 is a nice move by white, because white wants to just take on c5. White is threatening to win a pawn here. And black is essentially provoked to take on d4, which makes white happy, because after the pawns get traded, White is now ready to play knight c3 uh, and attack the queen with tempo. Um, so in this position, black, uh, black went terribly wrong and played a move which looks like a nice positional move. Black wanted to put as much pressure as possible on the d4 pawn. And he played, do you want to suggest a move? It's a losing move. e5. Probably not a great move, but Black played an even worse move. Ken West. Bishop g4 is probably a good move. <laughs> uh, yes. Knight c6. Knight c6 probably isn't good because knight c3 and d5, but Black played an even worse move. Arjun. Uh, f5 is really weird, but Black still played probably a, a much worse move. That's probably the worst move in the position. <laughs> it's not queen take a2. Let me show you the, yeah, did you want to say something? Knight h6 was played. And now um, white has a move here to win material by force, 
and some people see it right away. Um, I will say it's very similar to the idea from last game, from the Karpov game, where Karpov had undefended pieces or targets. In this case, there's two very, uh, very big targets for, for white to attack. Of course, the queen could be considered a target, but also the bishop on c8 is a target. It's not defended. And the knight on h6 is a target because it's attacked once and defended once. So it could potentially be attacked again. Um, what you should look for in this position is a double attack, white to move, how to uh, win material. Yeah, Vinny. Queen c1, very nice. Everyone wanted to say queen c1. Very good. Very subtle. This is a very like kind of quiet move. You just move the queen one square over, and you're utilizing the whole board. Some very nice geometry happening here. Um, and even like very strong players can sometimes neglect to see the whole board. Like sometimes you're just focused on the king side or just focused on the queen side, but you have to see, especially in open positions, you have to see uh, the sort of geometry. And in this case, yeah, white is. Uh, just winning a, a minor piece, and black just resigned. Um, that so moves. that was eight moves. Chess is tough. Let's move on. OK, I was debating whether to show the next game. I actually, the, ne the next game I'm going to show came to mind right before the lecture started. Um, but I want to show it just to illustrate a complete like brain lapse. Um, and maybe some of you remember this. This was played in St. Louis. It was the first round of the 2012 U.S. Championship. Yeah. Um, playing white is Grandmaster Alexander Stripunsky. Playing black is Grandmaster Alexander Anishuk. Two, uh, two American players. Hopefully you guys have heard of uh, at least one of them, hopefully both of them. Um, this game. I wanted to show because it, it kind of illustrates why you should be very careful, especially in the first round of a tournament. And you should always uh, do some kind of insanity check, where you're just checking the move before you make it, just to make sure you're sane. This is the one I'm thinking of. I was here when it happened. You were here. Were you in the, like, watching like, yeah. in the, the playing room? Yeah, it was pretty shocking. Um, so it started as a Carol Khan. Uh, knight c3, d5, and knight f3. This is what we call the two knights attack against the Karakhan. Um, it's actually one of my favorite variations to play as white. Uh, this game, Anishuk played the most common move, bishop g4, h3, and then bishop take f3. Um, sometimes it's a bit unusual for the bishop to trade the knight so early, but in this case, um, oh, it's not the one you were thinking of. Uh, in this case, black gets kind of a solid position. Um, he trades the bishop because black gets the pawns on light squares. And this is a, a nice positional idea. If you're going to put all your pawns on light squares, sometimes it makes sense to trade off your light squared bishop. Um, so game continues, g3. Uh, and it looks like white is just trying to be solid. Just play bishop g2 in castle. Nothing wrong so far. Um, now I think in this position, Anishuk, uh, maybe not yet. Uh, knight d7 was played, queen e2. Anishuk was already maybe considering some aggression, like maybe considering knight e5. So the queen retreated to e2, d4. And yeah, Anishuk was being uh, quite aggressive, knight b1, and now h5. Um, so some very early pawn lunges by black. The idea of h5 is to potentially play h4 and try and create some weakness in white's pawn structure. So white played h4 himself. And then Anishuk played another kind of ambitious, maybe somewhat unexpected move. Have you seen this game before? No? Do you want to suggest it? G5? Sorry? G5. Um, yeah, rather than developing the pieces, he's just pushing his pawns. Maybe the, the smaller children here should close their eyes. Um, but G5 is actually a nice positional move, because some idea is to play G4 and knight E5. And, uh, and maybe fixate on the, the weakness on f3. Um, so white played perhaps a natural response, h take g5, and now queen take g5. And now, uh, before we go any further, I just want to see what people would suggest here as white. Like, what would you play in this position? Feel free to suggest a move, and we'll see how many people would suggest the move that was played. Yes. Um, 
Bishop g2. Bishop g2. D3. 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 Okay, so three of you played the same move as a grandmaster. Normally, that's a good thing. <laughs> In this case, it was a very bad thing. Um, so, well, he, he completed the move. He played d3. Even if he touched the pawn and then realized, he has to play it. It's the only legal move with a d-pawn. And the, the funny thing is, he played d3, saw that his bishop is not defended, and then just resigned on his own turn. Usually you resign um, or on, uh, on his opponent's turn. Usually you resign on your own turn. In this case, he just saw that uh, queen takes c1 is coming. Um, and it was very tragic to start the US championship by making such a very bad blunder. Um, but it's like from a, a psychological standpoint, when your bishop is on c1 like this, you just assume it's defended. Sometimes you make false assumptions. And it was defended just a few moves ago before knight b1. It was defended by the rook. But the fact the knight is on b1 and the queen is no longer on d1 leaves the bishop just undefended. So you can kind of see a common theme, at least with this game and the previous games. It's undefended pieces are very important to identify. And even very strong players make very bad blunders. So that's why when you play a stronger player, you always have to realize that they're capable of making blunders, even the best in the world. Yeah. Um, next game, uh, let me see which one. Yeah, Carlson Caruana. Do you know this? Um, we're, we're probably, for this game, we're probably going to go straight to the end. If I'm not mistaken, this might be Caruana's quickest defeat in at least recent years, in the last decade maybe. Um, how long was this game? This game was 11 moves and Carlson won, which is not a good sign going into the World Championship. Um, but OK, this game was played in 2014, so hopefully Caruana has learned his lessons since then. Um, it, was, it was a French. No wonder he lost. <laughs> so not too much respect for the French then. You play the French? And you don't have respect for it. <laughs> OK, so. Um, We'll see. This is a, a topical line with c5 and knight f3. And OK, the pawns get traded, knight f6. Um, I will say I, I don't know too much of the theory here. Um, I know it's supposed to be relatively equal with good preparation from black. Um, but knight b5 is a very ambitious move, um, just aiming for the, the fork. Of course, Caruana sees the, the fork threat, plays knight a6. The game continues, knight to c3, queen d8, and now a3 by, by Carlson, um, which I think is a really nice prophylactic move. Um, as white, you might be inclined here just to complete development. But when a3 is played, he's realizing that um, perhaps a bishop wanted to go to b4. And after a3, now both the bishop and the knight are perhaps fighting for the c5 square. Um, so he's making it a bit more uncomfortable for, for black. He also might have ideas of playing b4 himself, just to take away the c5 square. Uh, so bishop b7 was played, queen f3, and now Caruana castles. And maybe now some of you realize that castling is a massive blunder. White to move, win a piece, simple tactics. Uh, yes, and back. Bishop take a6, right? Uh, because there's a pin. That's incredible. Like uh, Fabiano Caruana, number two in the world. But I think sometimes in, the, in some circumstances where you're playing uh, a very strong player and it's blitz and you're moving quickly, it's still possible to uh, overlook simple tactics. In this case, when queen f3 is played, it was sort of disguised as a uh, Maybe positional move, maybe there's ideas of queen g3, and you just forget to look for the tactical threat. That's why after every move your opponent plays, you should always ask yourself, what's the threat? Um, or are there tactics? Uh, we're going to move on to um, a Shirov game. Um, Shirov, black against Fiddler. 
uh, two very well-known GMs. Svidler, known for his, what, Chess Top 24 commentary, Super GM. Is he coming to St. Louis? Did he qualify for the Grand Chess Tour? No. No? Oh, that's kind of sad. And there's no wild card spot. Okay, he's doing commentary. Well, yeah, he either, like, if there's a huge tournament, he's either playing in it or doing commentary for it. Um, and he's very well versed in the opening, but in this game, um, now this was 2004, so maybe he's grown since then. This game was not so impressive by him. Um, e4. And we're going to see another French. But this time, we're going to see the black side of the French. We're going to see black win very quickly. And we'll see a line which perhaps isn't the most common, but is really interesting. And maybe someone, uh, maybe some of you can use this for blitz if, uh, if you're looking for something simple to play, um, at least in this variation, the advanced variation. So how many people here actually play the French as black? Some of you. Oh, a lot of you. OK. Um, and in the advanced variation, of course, you know the idea for black is to try and take down the center. Um, let me ask the French players here, what's uh, the worst thing about this variation for black? Yes? Your light squared bishop. Your light squared bishop, yeah. Also, maybe the space deficit, too. Um, but a light squared bishop is usually the worst piece, has the hardest time um, finding a, a good square in the position. So from very early on, we're going to see how Shirov solves this problem. Uh, c5, c3, and now queen b6. Now, I would think most people would play knight c6 first. Am I correct? Yeah. At least the French players. Queen b6 is a small nuance. Black is not committing the knight to c6 because there's an idea, as we'll see after knight f3, the idea is to play bishop d7 and then immediately go for bishop b5 and trade off black's worst piece for one of white's best pieces. When white has all the pawns on dark squares, at least the center pawns, the light square bishop is white's best piece. So this is actually a really nice positional idea for, uh, for black. Um, now, one of the downsides with this plan is that black does waste or does use a lot of time to execute this maneuver. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of theory around this line. And if white is well prepared, it should be good for white. But as we'll see in this game, uh, Svidler was not super prepared. Question? So it is white's move here. So it's an a4. a4 is possible. Maybe a4 is playable. Sometimes an issue with a4 is it weakens the b4 square. And these lines after take, take. Uh, b4 is weak because white can't play a3. And this is probably a good version of some kind of mainline advanced variation. Yep. There's some idea, yeah, knight c6 to, um, to a5 to b3. a4 is a bit weakening. Um, so I will show um, after bishop e2 and bishop to b5, uh, there are some options for white. I think the most aggressive option, and if you play this as white, it's probably something to look into, is this kind of wild move pawn c4 where you're trying to open up the center, maybe even sacrifice a pawn to uh, take advantage of black's kind of slow development and the fact that white is ready to castle very soon and play knight c3. Um, so this would probably be my recommendation. Um, what Svidler played was d takes c5, which I have a feeling is not a great move. Um, I will show just another option just to demonstrate this idea for black. If white plays a natural kingside castling, black would like to take on e2, take on e2, and play queen a6. And just trade queens and get a very positional game, where if the queens get traded in the French structure and the light squared bishops get traded, black is usually happy to, uh, to build up pressure on the queen side. Um, but let's stay with the game. d takes c5, bishop takes c5, and now a very surprising move from white, pawn b4. Very bold, very brave move. Um, now it's a playable move, but we're going to see it leads to a lot of uh, messiness. Um, white is essentially asking for bishop take f2, which happens. 
Now the idea for white is he sacrifices a pawn to try and take advantage of the fact that this bishop and the queen, they're kind of glued together, and the bishop doesn't really have any great squares. Um, and there's some threats here for white where, okay, white just wants to take on b5. And if bishop take e2, queen take e2, the bishop's just trapped. So black has to come up with uh, a move here. Black played bishop to d7. And I think at the time this was a novelty, where he's, he's maintaining the tension. There's no way for white to trap the bishop right away. And there's no way for white to kick the queen. So for the time being, black uh, keeps the bishop defended and um, doesn't lose material. So white played queen to d2. The threat is to play bishop d3 and trap the bishop on f2. So now, question. Uh, how to play as black? How can you not lose material and find a resource to not only defend, but create some attack? Yes? Knight what? Knight h6, very good. I think this is the only move. I grabbed this game from somewhere in the database, and it did come with annotations. And whenever you see this box next to knight h6, it means only move. And sometimes people will say knight h6 box, and it means, uh, simply means only move. Um, only move, uh, which means any other move would be losing for black, essentially. In this case, the idea of knight h6 is to play knight g4, create some resources. Um, so h3, <laughs> knife f5. This time it's black playing knife f5. And knight g3 it would be a devastating checkmate. Even after bishop d3, this is still mate. g4 is probably the best move, and then black will uh, win the exchange. Yeah. Uh, so h3 wasn't played. Bishop d3 was played. Apparently, this is a, a really bad mistake because it allows black a lot of initiative. White was just trying to continue with the original plan. I think it would have been better for white to play some other move. There were some other options. z4 would have been interesting, idea of playing c5. Um, but there, there's many other lines that we could delve into, which we won't just for the sake of time. Uh, let's see how, uh, how white lost in just a few more moves. Knight g4 is played. Black is already doing very well because e3 is very weak. And keep in mind, black is up a pawn here. And black has an attack. There's now ideas of bishop e3, maybe even knight e3. And white is under major pressure. Um, so white played, uh, played a blunder here. Queen f4 should have been played, but white played queen g5. And now I believe black played one more move and white resigned. So black to move and find the, the, the crushing move, which makes white resign. Yes? Bishop h4. Um, Bishop h4, you're threatening the queen, and you're threatening mate. Um, but queen take h4. And I think I maybe misspoke. The next move was not the last move, um, but it's, it's really the key idea in the position. Maybe you guys saw it, yeah? Bishop g3, it's an idea, um, but there's a stronger move. Yeah. Bishop g1. Oh, bishop e1. Maybe king take e1, the king can run. Queen, queen f2, king d1. So in a lot of these lines where you're removing the bishop, like bishop g3 or bishop to g1, um, there's, there's ways for the king to run to like e2. And um, there, there's a much more crushing response, yeah. Bishop b5. Um, I think a lot of you were focused on mating on f2, but there's a, an additional mating idea where if bishop take b5, queen take b5 is just ending in mate. You saw that, nice. Good job, Ken West. Um, and meanwhile, black is threatening maiden one. Any maiden one threat, it's a forcing move. And the difference we'll see here uh, after c4. 
now bishop g3. And now if the white king runs away, um, I should note bishop g3 I think was the final move of the game. Uh, Spiller just resigned here. If queen take g4 or h take g3, queen f2 is mate, because both pieces are supporting f2. It's a very nice clearance move. If he runs to, oh, to e2. Now the idea is to play queen f2, king d1, and now the bishop has access to a4. Uh, bishop takes c2 would be the final mate. I do have a file of, uh, of some more miniatures, which I think what I'll do is put together a study on Leeches. We'll share it in the video description so people can see these games and can look at, uh, look at the analysis, add your own, own analysis, and hopefully.